G'day everybody, welcome back to The Shed, I'm BC. Got a bit of an unusual item on today. Mike's over here with a workpiece that had a broken tap in it. And surprise, surprise, we drilled it out. Uh, so far we haven't restored the thread, but we will. But one item that did surprise me is the tap drilled a hell of a lot faster dry than with the oil. So it was obviously thermally failing the material as it came out. It was a carbon steel tap, and Mike had heated it up with a TIG welder a bit, but man, it was hard. It was like valve grinding paste coming out of the hole. So I'll bring you in closer, you can see what we're up to. Okay. Well, here we are back again at the job this time. And uh, success. I like showing you things when they work properly. I hate it when I lose. But we'll zoom in. This is a job Mike calls a rope cutter to go around a boat propeller. And um, that particular hole the tap broke off. It was about 10 mil below the surface. Uh, job's been successful and um, it was surprising, but no great uh, information there. Just talk about the tools a little bit. Now the end of the tap wasn't nice and flush, so as per the instructions, ball nose carbide burr, and that put a wonderful little centre in there. And the highlight of the whole job, Sutton Salt Carbide Drill. Um, very well made, very heavy there, a microfine carbide, and the shanks were a little bit bigger than the working part of the drill. Uh, surprised it was drilling slowly but successfully uh, with just hydraulic oil for a lube but I actually decided to give it a try halfway down dry and immediately the penetration speed just doubled so it wasn't actually drilling it was thermally failing the workpiece um, drilled it out we then used a gun tap this fellow as my suggestion got about halfway down the hole and it just started to jam and I thought, oh bloody hell, not worth breaking a high speed steel tap in there. Uh, so we went and got a brand new intermediate tap off the shelf, straight through like a piece of butter. So my gun tap is blunt, needs regrinding. Anyway, successful job. Many man hours building that part would have been lost without this. Bye for now, like and subscribe. Back again. Uh, job was successful. Just showing you a lineup of the tools that we used to get the job done. Uh, quite an assortment. Little carbide bar that we went down with first. There it is. The side of the centre for the drill. Once again, the carbide drill from Sutton. We drilled about 85% of the way down through the tap, and then I used that little punch to bang the bottom of the tap out. It just fell away quite easily. Now it was a crescent shaped item and we use the torpedo level on the left there to set it up equal height legs in the vise to make sure we we're going to go down straight and loosen off this clamp a little bit and back out a little square to keep the tap up straight so all just rudimentary items that you find in every ship but the job was well done I haven't done a get her out like that for a, a long time but amazingly, once again, a carbide drill drilling into a tap. I don't think it was high speed. I think it was a tungsten steel tap. It was reasonably hard, but yeah, a tip this time, it drilled a lot faster without lube. So bye for now. Please like and subscribe. And I'll do another video in a few minutes on tool and cutter setup. Bye. Hello again. Welcome back to the shed. I'm VC. I've been rambling on about tool and cutter grinders for some time and I realised that I hadn't really given an overview on what the different parts of the grinder are and how they operate. So I'll just simply run over the features on the wrong foo and why I think this is quite an applicable machine. Okay, I know I'm chopped off and I'm trying to give you a better feel, feel of vision. Okay, we'll start with the wheel head. This is the grinding wheel operational area and surprisingly there's three axes just on this simple part of the equipment. One is the rise and fall, operated by the handle. Second is the pivot of the head. And the third is the angle of the head. Now, with this particular setup for any of the cutters, I use the tilt of the head to provide the clearance behind the cutting edge. Now, I do have a similar 
adjustability on the workhead, but for some reason it just doesn't give me clearance to get in behind the cutter. I've tried it several times to tilt that up, have this level. It just won't respond. I just can't do the bloody job. I can't explain it. But three axes on just the wheel head. Now on the table, this machine is very adjustable and I'll bring you around here later on to show you a little bit more. You've got a sub table and the upper table. The sub table can move in and out about 200 millimeter, which gives it a great variation in scope. But also it's got a short leg and a long leg on the grinding wheel here. So if you spin that 180 degrees, it changes the position of the wheel. So you can bring the table up onto a different wheel. And that would be good because it saves you changing wheels for all your different operations. Now the top table can swivel a little bit, but there's no micrometer adjustment. So you know, whether I'd ever use that or not, I don't know. It'd be a pig to set it back up again. In this case, uh, the fellow that was first using this machine, he was my storm and internal salesman at the time, was a bit taller than me, so he made a spacer for the work head and lifted the wheel head up. And it made it a bit easier for him, but I think that's reduced the rigidity of the machine. For instance, the column is only held by one plastic knob screw on the side, and I don't know whether there's any rigidity in that, and this gives it a bit more vibration. So I'm going to source a sturdy, uh, quite high pallet, so I can lift the whole machine up and get into a much more comfortable envelope. But anyway, we've got the movement on the main table or the base table. Then we've got the in and out with this knob, that's the in-feed. We've got longitudinal feed there. We've got rotating on the base, angle of the head, and rotating of the tool. So let's count these axes up. So that's one, two, we're not counting the subtable, two, three, four, five. So overall, that's eight axes of adjustment. That's one hell of an adjustable machine. You can run into some problems. It's uh, a fair way out on the table at the moment. This is just a comfortable way to grind cutters. But if you go to a 75 or 100 mil cutter, we would probably have to rotate the uh, grinding head over and bring the table up a little bit closer. So uh, this machine also has table stops and this will make you laugh. The table stop has had an Allen key in there for locking up the stop ever since we bought the machine and you'd think some dopey bugger would put a bloody T handle or something on there but no we haven't. Now that stop just bangs up against the stop plate and it's adjustable by you to control the end feed if I wanted to happen a little bit earlier. Just move the stop along, lock it up, and there's your new position. On a good tool and cutter grinder, as the one behind me or on the big Toz, there should be an adjustable stop there to make it a lot easier than trying to wangle the cutter in. So there's your axes, eight movable axes overall on this machine, a lockable stop down there, uh, indexer on the top. I'll come in from this side shortly and you can have a better look at it. So to me this is a pretty universal machine. I think it could be improved on greatly with a longer table and longer travel, about half a tonne of concrete in the base, all of these uh, tubular sections full of concrete or some sort of ballast to get rid of a bit of the vibration. But realistically for the small amount you pay for these machines and what they can do, they are really pretty bloody good. It depends a lot on your attachments, etc. Okay, I'll bring you in for the second. Okay, now you're in from the operator side and having a look at where I work from. Uh, it's all within easy reach. Table operates quite well. Uh, for something that's fairly badly worn, etc., I'm happy with what I get out of it. Uh, a fair bit of slop in the feed, although I haven't serviced this machine for probably four or five years now. It does really need the table taking off again and clean all the guck out, adjust the gibbs up. Now, this is the subsection that slides and it's on these two slots and the ways that it moves in. I would say there's six or seven inches, 150 to 170 millimeters that you could move it in and roll the whole wheel over. And it's fairly lightly built 
uh, and could be improved but for what I do it does uh, quite well. Now this is the original basic work head there is also a center so you can put up between centers the other center is a quick action to get out of the way to change tools over. If you're going to buy one tool and cutter grinder and having worked this and the Clarkson quite a bit lately the Clarkson is very good for what you can do with it this is very good because it's more universal you can get a lot more work out of it and you've got three positions on the work head or three axes on the work head wheel head where on the Clarkson there's only rise and fall so a lot more adjustable here I would really like to get my big tires going or the Cincinnati number two just to get more tool real estate uh, must be a table means you can have two or three setups running at the same time and saves me breaking things down but yeah this will do find one of these they came in under Hafco, Heron Forbes, uh, Rongfu quite a lot of different names but you can see what the machine's like if you're going to spend two two and a half thousand dollars get something like this okay we'll uh, do a bit more later on I have done a previous video that you should look for on tool and cutter grinder table stops yeah I don't want to incorporate in this and just double up with previous work but it stops being adjustable or being fixed and there's several different styles are uh, quite an important part of your grinding life okay please like and subscribe I'll put this one up today